Welcome, everyone. Welcome to We Earth Radio. This is your host, Michael Stone, and I am so thrilled to have my friend Andrew Harvey on today. He is one of the world's most honored mystics and spiritual teachers and a leading translator of Rumi and Kabir, history's most, most renowned mystical poets, an Oxford-trained religious scholar and founder of the Institute for Sacred Activism. He's the author of more than 40 books and maintains an active teaching schedule, both in the US and abroad. Welcome, Andrew. Lovely to be with you, Michael. Lovely to see you again. Yes, oh. likewise. And I just, I wanted to start with um, talking a little bit about your background and when you first discovered the mystical poets, having been born in, in India and, uh, you know, uh, a, a close relationship with Kabir and Rumi and how their readings affected your life. Obviously, they did mm. because this new book, Emboldenment, A Year with Kabir, is absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a question. <laughs> well, my great love affair with mystical poetry started with 17th century English poetry because I was a literature major at Oxford and I discovered George Herbert and Henry Vaughan and above all Thomas Trahan because in the library at Oxford in a special library called the Duke Humphreys Library which contained all the manuscripts there was the original copy of Thomas Trahan's great work The Centuries where he describes his ecstatic experiences and I would go to that little library and sit and just read in his tiny handwriting the 17th century master's vision of the world saturated with God. I met Rumi later because I met Rumi at the end of my 20s in French translation, in a translation by a great, great French scholar and mystic and poet, Eva de Vitre Meyerovitch, who later became a very close friend. Mm. And I didn't understand what I was reading, but I knew it was absolutely extraordinary. So I set about learning a little bit of Persian and also plunging into translating Rumi myself and plunging into my own mystical search. And as the veils started to burn away, the words of Rumi became pregnant with passion and truth and light. And I realized I was in an ecstatic inner relationship with him and that he would mirror all the stages of my own path in his extraordinary words. So I really fell deeply in love with Rumi and worked on my translations of him, my works on him, as if I was in his presence. And that was a huge clue to me because what I discovered in those years was that these great mystical poets, and Rumi and Kabir are the two greatest mystical poets the world has ever had, the two, the prophet of love and the prophet of truth. What I discovered is that they are totally and absolutely and finally and completely alive right now. Their words aren't just words, they're impregnated with initiatory power. And so I lived for Ooh, 35 years incessantly in the company of Rumi while I was doing my other work, starting sacred activism, writing other kinds of books. And then I finally, in my 60s, dared to turn to confront Kabir because I'd loved Kabir since my early 20s when I was in Benares and met him for the first time in the heart. But I was frightened of him because he's extremely ferocious, he's extremely clear, and translating him is very hard because he's so naked, so simple, that if you're not naked and simple, one bad word can destroy the thrust mm -hmm. of his passion. And in my 60s, I was living in Arkansas in a log cabin with two cats in the middle. I remember. Of... <laughs> yes. And so finally, I thought I might be ready to confront the big kahuna, the great assassin of God, the tremendous prophet of truth that is Kabir. And it was the most extraordinary experience because 
just deciding to open the floodgates of love. And he appeared really in my heart and guided me. And I produced one book called Turn Me to Gold. And then when COVID struck, I thought, what if I'm going to die, what would I love to give humanity before I die, if I'm allowed to? And the answer was as clear as diamond. It was another book on Kabir, a yearbook, which would take people through the entire mystical universe of Kabir and introduce them to the theme that had emerged in my own exploration of Kabir, which I haven't found echoed in many of the writers on him in any of them, which is that Kabir lived through a transfiguration process, an engoldenment process. He was, he knew, turned to gold in heart, mind, soul, and body. And this is very important, I think, because... I believe we're in a massive evolutionary crisis, a global dark night whose secret meaning is to birth an embodied divine humanity, an engoldened humanity. And that I believe from my own inmost experience that Kabir is one of the pioneers of this tremendous birth. Jesus is one, Kabir is one, Shams is one. Beings who broke through into the dimension of absolute golden presence, mind, heart, soul, and body. And so show us at this terrible moment what we must be, can be, will be, if we allow this terrible process to eat away our vanity, our illusions, our false mysticisms, and plunge into an adoration of the one and become one with the one. So for me, Kabir is literally the greatest imaginable guide to this crisis because he knew it was coming even in the 15th century. He lived in the 15th century, but he knew perfectly well that we were in Kali Yuga and it was going to get a lot worse because he looked around and he saw the corruption and the violence and the cruelty and the madness, and the insanity, the ignorance, and he knew it was going to get worse, but he knew too that there was a stupendous gift in the horror. And that gift was that it made those who were awake to the horror utterly aware that the only possible life you could live is a life that is grounded and rooted in the deathless, in what cannot be destroyed, in what cannot be dissolved by the madness around. And he knew something which was really astounding, which was known too by the great Christian mystics, by the Kabbalists, by the Shaivites. And that was that this period was ordained. It had to come, this tremendous cleansing, this devastating purification. And that if we could align with its deepest laws and surrender to the one that is doing this to us, then what that one would give us is one ning oneness with the one mm. and so for six or seven months during covid i slaved it wasn't slavery but it felt sometimes like slavery because it was so hard on really translating and must have translated 800 poems and then really found the ones that spoke the loudest and clearest to us and then arranged them in the order that the book has. And I'm absolutely thrilled that the book exists. It's a complete mystical education. But even more than that, it's an introduction to a being who, if you melt into him through his words, will start speaking to you very clearly, fiercely, directly, nakedly in the core of your life and give you stupendous guidance specifically for this terrible and amazing time. Yeah, well, I have to say your transition, your translation really uh, awakened the beloved in my own heart. You know, I, I really had a sense of that. And you said something a minute ago about uh, that it was alive for the times we're in for a lot right now. Yes. I, I want to talk a little bit maybe about mystical texts in general, because the difference between 
something that chronicled the time, like uh, Kabir was living in the 15th century, although in Wikipedia it says he went from the 14th to the 16th and he was 120 years old. That is a fantasy. I think <laughs> I'm not going kind to of think that is just part of the crazy hagiography that the Indians love. <laughs> he was probably born about 1414. He died, we know, in about 1518. So yeah. I think if he died at 60. Yeah, yeah, so 60. Uh, yeah 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 but but the thing about uh that really there's certain text like for me the Tao, um oh, yes. uh and Rumi, and uh i love i don't know a lot of people don't know but i love anthony de Mello. um i think you knew him didn't you no i never knew him but oh, i knew yeah. him he's wonderful yeah, yeah, yeah true. People, people like that the truth just is you can't escape it. No. You know? It's truth and, speaking. It's truth yeah. vibrating, isn't it? And one of the things about Kabir is that he spoke in the common language and yes. he spoke to everyone. The, the, you know, and you mentioned that in your foreword there that um, the cab drivers sing his praise and the, you know, the just. Yes, the, the cigarette the sellers, the boatmen everybody in Benares knows Kabir and everybody in India knows Kabir because you know Kabir was a tremendous radical very ferocious he really couldn't stand the costume party of Hinduism and Islam he believed that the boys club was the great block to direct realization but they rewarded him by absorbing him because the Hindus claimed him and said he was the greatest Hindu mystical poet so they all loved him and then the Muslims said he was the greatest Sufi poet and they all loved him and then the Sikhs came along and the Guru Nanak put 300 of Kabir's greatest poems into the core of the great Sikh scriptures so Kabir had a has a monumental effect on all the religions of India while stressing the direct path to God beyond religion. And his genius was, as you said, to express himself in the common language, because before him, most of the great mystical poetry had been written in Sanskrit and was the privilege of an elite, uh, the Brahmin class that he found very corrupt. And he was dying to reach everybody. And he himself was blue collar. He was a poor marginalized Muslim weaver in a crazy sacred Hindu town. And through writing in the vernacular, he broke every conceivable barrier so that he could talk directly as a great blue colored, in golden, supreme divine human being to absolutely everyone and what's so moving when you go to india especially when you go to benares and talk to people about kabir is how they get this how they get that someone loved them so much and believed in them so deeply and hated the caste system so strongly and hated the barriers between all kinds of people so profoundly loved them so much that he would just speak nakedly to them. And they always say the same thing. My buddies, when I talk to them about Kabir, he said, they say, he's our buddy. He's our friend. He speaks to us in the language we understand and we get it. We get it because he's not playing games with us. We trust him because he's absolutely naked with us. And I believe that as a human race, we've come to the time when we need a naked, fierce, exalted, clear, absolutely uncompromising voice to do three things, to say to us, for God's sake, wake up, you idiots, stop wasting your lives, your lives and the world are burning. The second thing that we need a voice to say is, you have the divine within you. The divine is appearing in you and as you. And don't listen to any philosophy or any religion or any authority that tells you any different. Because if you can truly understand that you are a hologram of the beloved, 
the beloved of the beloved and experience that, then your entire vision of life will be transformed. And the third reason we need him is that he makes it absolutely clear that the dark night is necessary. We have to learn how to die to our hubris, our madness, our illusion. But that at the other side of this dying is unparalleled life, eternal life in a body, not floating off into some heavenly otherwhere, but finally arriving here as our authentic human divine selves, utterly human and utterly divine in every single cell and muscle and bone of our being, a new human race. Mm. Those are the messages that have yes, to get. Yes, I love that. Uh, you know, in my meditation this morning, I had, because I've been reading this all, all week. I've read the whole Thank book you. and gone back into it. And I was meditating this morning and I had this, this thought that, you know, if I totally accepted the beloved in my own heart, then all the things that I don't accept of myself can be accepted by the beloved. Absolutely. <laughs> and I thought, well, gee, that's pretty, you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> I know it's. I, I'd love to share with you an experience I had once, and it was very powerful. It was about 10 years ago, and I had an afternoon in which I was shown very brutally every mistake I'd made and my vanity and my folly and my craziness, everything was exposed mm -hmm. in the most precise, brutal detail. And I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed because I tried so hard to be a decent person and clearly I'd made endless, hysterically awful mistakes. And then, and this was so wonderful, I heard laughter in the room. I was in Oak Park in another little flat that I lived in, and I had laughter in the room, and it was the beloved. And the beloved said out loud, I've known all of this about you forever, and it hasn't stopped me loving you completely, so stop it. And I started to laugh with the laugh. We are so much more intensely and amazingly loved than we could ever imagine. And one of the great rewards of a long mystical journey is coming to begin to know that. We've already been forgiven by love. And it's waking up to that rapture of being free and new in love that the great mystics are always inviting us. Look what Rumi has put in front of his tomb, you know, come, come, whoever you are, however many times you've made mistakes and broken your vows, this is not the kingdom of despair. You're welcome. Sit with us. We love you. That's God. And that's Kabir and Rumi. That's the voice of truth. Yeah. Yeah. It's like Rumi's guest house, you know, welcome, welcome it all, the whole thing, you know, the, the, the craziness, the, the ego, the madness, the jealousy, or everything, but offer it, offer it up for healing. We can't heal it on our own, but grace can heal it by showing us that it has already accepted those things and worked with those things, and it can help us over time go far, far beyond those things if we surrender to it. Let's, Andrew, let's talk about the direct paths, because I know a lot of people who have been indoctrinated into different churches and religions, right. and fundamentalists uh, thinking, and have seen the lies and the hypocrisy yeah. in those systems. And right. they've kind of, what my grandmother used to say, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Oh, yeah. You know? and, and who can so, blame them? The bathwater is so filthy. <laughs> really? The baby is pretty obscured by all that filth. But it's crazy to throw the baby out because the baby is the mystical traditions. Exactly. Yeah. And in all of the great religions, crazy though they are, some of the dogmas and, and of course, the whole male-dominated structure is crazy. In the great mystics of all the great traditions, you'll find unparalleled truth and encouragement and amazing similarities of understanding. So that is where 
I beg people to look not to the structures of religion, which I think are over, but to the actual reality of reality itself and the testimony of those in all religions who have come into direct naked relationship with that reality. They are our best friends. They are our brothers and sisters, and we need them like oxygen at this moment, which is why I've been putting so much of my time, not just into writing books about sacred activism and direct path and Christian mysticism, God knows what, but also in presenting to the seekers of now the greatest imaginable voices, which I think are Rumi's and Kabir's, the two great universal mystical poets that can truly speak to us right now on whatever path we're on and give us the wine of reality to get soberly and steadily drunk on. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of the things that also I really loved in Engoldenment, your new book, is um, I kept finding Gabrielle, our mutual friend, Gabrielle Roth in there. Go to the body, go to the body, go to the oh, body. Oh, God, yes. You know? well, she and loved was- Kabir. <laughs> I know. She loved Rumi and she loved Kabir because I was going to be, I was working with Gabrielle, as you probably know, on a book at the end of her life when she was dying on joining the five rhythms to the great mystical path of love with Rumi. But she also loved Kabir because Gabriel knew that without the body being totally present, we would be lost in our fantasies, in our head, in some transcendental imagination. And she knew the truth of what Kabir says when he says, my father is the absolute Godhead. My mother is the embodied Godhead. And I am the divine child dancing for them both on their burning dance floor. When I read those lines, I think of Gabrielle because she was utterly abandoned to the mystery, to the one, to the formless, but she was completely within her body at the same time. And her body was expressing that utter abandonment to the one. So it was overwhelmingly alive. Her toes were alive. Her wrists were alive. Her ankles were alive. Her cheeky mouth was alive. (laughs) And her big heart. (laughs) And her huge, huge heart. She was a very, very great being yeah. Gabrielle. Yeah. and I was very privileged to be her friend as you were what an incredible example of someone who never took the bypass always went into the mess in the dark and found jewel after jewel there just as Kabir recommends us to do yeah it was a 40 40 year relationship um, with me it's- you know, I was also around her at the end, but also in the very early days too. So it was really, really beautiful. You know, two things right now, and I'd love to hear, you know, your sense from a mystical perspective that in terms of my own teaching, because there's two areas that I'm looking at. Uh, one is relating and the other is uh, dealing with trauma. Uh, And uh, when I look at climate change and I look at uh, enslavement and I look at poverty and greed and all of these things, you know, you think all these different solutions, oh, we need a political, we need a technological solution. No, we need to learn how to relate. And I think of relating as opposed to relationships, one being a noun and the other being a verb, you know, we have this, this relationship, which is very much grounded in this trauma, the sea of trauma that we live in, that has been going on for hundreds of thousands of years. And it makes war and uh, all of these other things, uh, just normal. Oh, yeah, it's just normal. And this so this ability, the, the solution to all of them are, how do we relate to each other, you know? And, and of course, COVID I, brought, I, brought I, out I, the worst of, of that uh, and, and really revealed the hypocrisy and the racism and the separation and the vaxxed and unvaxxed and this whole thing that's, that's happening 
And instead of being an opportunity for deepening understanding and relating, it's become another buffer between us and being managed by the powers that be, because we kind of have like three possible ways to go. Total annihilation of life on the planet, authoritarianism, or an awakening. Well, the authoritarianism would certainly ensure the annihilation. That we can be sure of. Right, and that's, and that's what's happening too. Right. I mean, everything that's happening is going in that direction. And so, you know, my, my thinking about that is how can these sacred texts that are unique because sacred texts, so many actually take, like I said, the Tao and other, other spiritual and Christian ways show us this path of direct revelation, but we're so traumatized and we're so stuck in the othering rather than the connecting that we need we need something that's a um you know a fulcrum or something that can open up and to me that is direct revelation but how do we seed that in a in a way that um is really timely and impactful and effective uh and i know it starts with our own sphere of influence but well, I think that you're opening up a huge conversation, but let me let me begin by saying I think that the greatest revelation of all is that God is relation. God is an interdependent web of communion and that God arrives most deeply in our lives when we love and are loved back and experience that third force that we're one with, that is loving itself through our loving each other. So the first thing that has to happen is a real revisioning of God, of the entire field. And that is, of course, something the great mystics know. Once you discover God is relationship and God is longing for you to be in ecstatic relationship with God and with all of the creation that is God's body and all beings that are God's ambassadors and representatives of God, then a magical door opens and you realize that you're on this earth to have divine relationships with plants, with stones, with friends, with men, with women, with little girls dancing in the courtyard, with little boys running around, with the entire human race and the creation. That's why you're here to experience what God experiences in relationship and through relationship. So I think that revisioning of God is absolutely essential. And it's at the core, for example, of Christian mysticism, because the grandeur and majesty of the vision of the Trinity, of God being one, but having three interrelated persons working in that one, reveals what this relatedness is like. There's a source which is endless and boundless and empty and pregnant, that you could call the father mother there's the creation out of that source through love and that's the son and the daughter and then there's this connection between the source and the creation that is love in its wildest most creative purest most noble form and that's the spirit so if you come into that realization that you're one with the eternal source, you're one with everything it creates, and you're one with the love that links what it creates to itself, then you realize you are living a sacred life quite normally. You're normally and naturally divine. The whole experience is divine. The whole world is flooded with the glory of God. Every wild little cat is God in drag. That's what happened. <laughs> and, and, and that is that. also unnameable. That's one of the things right. that I love about Kabir is that the moment you name it, you reify it. You yes. make it into something. It's a no thing that is something when it wants to. And it yeah, right. is both, yes. 
And it's neither. It's both and neither. Yeah. It's everything you can say about it and then what can only be left unsaid but experienced directly. And Kabir again and again says, I have no idea what God's up to. Who does? But I know that God is appearing in and as everything and God is living inside me and that's enough. So to get to your second point, which is about revelation, look, the most important healing power of trauma is sacred practice. You can go for years and years to therapy and that does help and you can be with a very skillful therapist, especially a Jungian therapist, and that does help. And it does make the patterns that your trauma has created available to you. But the only force that can heal the wounds of unlovability and self-rejection and self-loathing and self-rage that trauma creates, the only force is the direct force of the light, of the divine truth, of love. And there's very simple ways of getting into connection with that. And that's one of the geniuses of Kabir. Jesus taught one prayer, the our father, which he knew to be an all comprehensive prayer. Kabir taught one practice. He said, look, don't bother about all the complicated practices and standing on one toe in the Himalayas and getting fancy costumes and doing elaborate, elaborate invocations. All of that's ego. Say the name of God, the name of the beloved that you love the most the name of the unnameable one that you adore the most because of your background or because you've had an experience, say that name passionately, deeply, relentlessly, incessantly, and the mirror of your heart will be cleaned and you will know you are loved. You will see the light. You will see the light consciousness that you are one with and that will change everything. And with that knowledge, with that knowledge that you are absolutely loved beyond imagining and sustained beyond imagining, which is not an intellectual knowledge, but a direct experience, you'll be able to turn to your own traumas and not only come to understand their impact on your life, but through grace, direct the light to heal them. Mm. That's brilliant. Um, but it's the truth. Yeah. There is no other way to heal this. But there are simple ways to heal. That's why I produced this book in Golden Room, because I wanted people to see that Kabir understands the whole question. And he understands that the solution is simple. It's that we turn up in the relationship with reality and ask reality to wake us up to truth by saying the name that we worship reality through with great adoration and reality will do the work. Yeah, I just had an epiphany. Thank you. You know, in, in my classes in relating, you know, which is I distinguish relationship and relating and, and, and teach, you know, uh, how can we connect better with each other? And one of the things that I often say is, well, look, we're mammals and mammals before they can self-regulate have to be able to co-regulate. If you didn't have uh, co-regulation, you weren't seen, felt, heard, adored, given direction, then you have to find that somehow. And so, you know, co-regulation, finding someone who's a, a teacher, I want to look at teachers, spiritual teacher that you can actually be seen, felt and heard and not told what to do, but be witnessed. And, and then yeah. if you're talking, I think, well, the ultimate co-regulator, of course, is the beloved. You Absolutely. <laughs> and the ultimate co-regulators are the ones who the beloved has united I, to the yeah, beloved. Yeah. And Rumi is one of them and Kabir is one of them. I once was in Paris and sitting by the Seine and I'd had a wild afternoon with Eva and we'd been translating Rumi together. And I was asking myself, who on earth is this extraordinary being? It's just unbelievable what he was, is, what he did. And at that moment, I saw this bird, this great white bird, and I still don't know what this bird, what kind of bird it was. I've never seen it since. 
And this bird was sitting about 20 yards down the sand and it went, it flew up and it went straight towards the sun. And it stopped at the very moment when it was about to go completely into the sun and get lost in the light. And all I could see was the outline of the bird's wing. (laughs) <laughs> and that was my answer. That was Rumi. Mm. So in Rumi and Kabir, we have people who are united with the beloved, but given by the beloved the extraordinary grace of being able to speak out of the experience so that we can become intoxicated enough by the glory and beauty and passion and strength and vibrancy of what they're revealing to finally understand two things that we've been looking for love in all the wrong places. That's where it is. And that there's a simple way of getting there. And that is through, as Rumi said, through remembrance and as Kabir said, through saying the name of God, just turn up in the relationship and God will reveal to you the mysteries directly, nakedly in the core of your life. And that will heal all traumas, including the deepest and t- most terrible of traumas, the trauma of separation, the trauma of believing yourself abandoned in a darkened world. Yeah. I want to I wanna look at attachment and suffering with you, mm. but I'd like to do it through maybe reading some of the poems from your, your book. Oh, I'd love that. Yeah. Um, do you have any that just ba- jump out at you? I mean, there's so no, many. That... You re- you read one. You read one that jumps out at you. I would. Got... Um, well, there's so many. Um, uh, let's see. Well, I just opened to April 21st here. In every house, in every house, there burns a lamp, but you are blind and don't see it. Keep trying. One day you'll see it and be free from death's noose. It isn't a question of eloquence or of listening or of ritual. To see it, you have to die while alive and then you'll never die again. In every house, a lamp is burning. Neither yoga nor chanting, piety or vice will help you see it. You have to die while alive and then Kabir promises you'll never die again. There's your answer. To your <laughs> I always love opening to something I'm marking. Oh, yeah. Well, don't you think the first thing that we have to detach ourselves from is our story of our inadequacy, of our helplessness, of our limitation. And that story has been pressed down upon us by fundamentalist science, by politicians, by a whole culture of secularism, and by religions that have used terror to enforce authority. And not only, I was going to say not only our inadequacy, but the things that we think will feed and fix the inadequacy. Right, but they follow. Yeah. Because if you think that you're lost and abandoned and that the only things that you can cheer yourself up with are sex, drugs, rock and roll, power and domination, that's what you'll go for. And they will prove horribly unsatisfying. But if you don't know what the mystics know, the ones who have awoken, which is the divine consciousness is living in you as your essential self. If you don't get that and do the work to understand that before yourself, you will be trapped your whole life in attachment and in the false self. And that's where suffering comes in because what you discover as all mystics know, is that when you start to open up, you'll be given some astounding experiences of oneness. And you'll be so amazed at what you can live. And then those experiences will vanish because they're hints and you have to do the work to get them. And part of the work is suffering the loss of that realization and doing the work to make it clear for you. So you suffer in love, for love, so that you can become clear enough and humble enough and surrendered enough for love to take you over and possess you. No one gets into the room of love without dying to the full self. Yeah, yeah. Suffer- suffering is that, that losing of the, the false self. 
that yes my god who am i without that i'm a yes. doctor i'm a lawyer i'm a, a whatever you know if i lost that then who would i be I, well not just that suffering but the suffering of the agony of the world the suffering of physical right. suffering all the forms of suffering that are on the planet can be seen as acid agents to dissolve the fantasy of power of the full self mm. all the psychic and spiritual and physical forms of suffering have one purpose and that is to show you that you are ultimately fragile and that all of your games are just that they're games and they're games that you're trying to cover up your fundamental fragility with and then suffering will show you love that you're loved in that suffering you're sustained in that suffering and that if you can use it in the highest sense it will become your greatest friend because it will say two things to you it will say a huge no to repeating all the activities and fantasies and thought forms that created that suffering and it will also say yes yes to the being that you glimpsed you could be in naked mystical communion yes to doing the work with love itself to become love andrew do you have one that you'd like to read yourself about fear particularly and it's another area that how do how do we um find the inner courage and that direct revelation to transcend the fear that stops us from being from doing the work that we really need to do you can't discover that until you start doing the work it there is no way you can discover right. well it is the work without, yeah. it is so it will just go on being intolerable until finally you decide to take off the shirt of flame and stop torturing yourself unnecessarily and start doing the work humbly and then everything will be given to you but you cannot stop the fear by the consciousness that is riddled with the fear you have to undertake a journey to discover the consciousness in you that is beyond good and evil beyond loss beyond fear beyond terror that is peaceful and loving and stable and joyful and blissful you have to do it there's one i love and this is april the 28th gods come and go that remains universes explode that never changes why love anything less than the always real mm -hmm. just one glimpse of who you are and you'll see everything else is unworthy of your essential dignity meanwhile for a million million lives you go on believing your role in a bad play in an unreal theater wake up take off the makeup stop talking peel off your face so his face appears yeah i love that one yeah i think the two things that are really important in that the first is just one glimpse of who you are just one glimpse will show you that your fears whatever they are are unworthy of the dignity of your essential self i've been reading today the extraordinary works of a great christian saint elizabeth of the trinity who died at 26 of a horribly painful disease addison's disease and she knew that this terrible suffering she was going through was also a mystical suffering because she knew that she'd asked to be Jesus's true beloved and to be the beloved of the Christ you accept the passion you accept the crucifixion you accept the suffering that comes from being authentic but she also knew that this suffering was passing terrible though it was it wasn't the ultimate relationship which was one of abandoned ecstasy as she called it in the abyss of grandeur that is the divine beloved she knew that so she offered up her suffering 
and she remained ecstatic in horror. She woke up that anything less is playing a role in a bad play in an unreal theater. If you don't know who you are, you'll be tempted to try out all kinds of roles, the hero, the multimillionaire, the famous teacher, all the roles, and they'll all fail you because none of them are as amazing as the real role, which is to be the beloved in the body through the grace of the beloved. And once you really, really begin to get that, then you do the work and you wake up and you take off the makeup that you've been putting on so badly to play the different roles. And you stop talking, which is very difficult for me, but something I do manage when I'm alone and really commune in silence with the vastness of the presence so that it can speak to you in words of luminous experience. And then in the end, you peel off your face, you die to the false self. You realize that everything you think about yourself is reactive, reactive to trauma or convention or family or your own misunderstood experience. And when you peel off your face, something amazing happens. You see that you are actually the beloved. His face, the face of the beloved, her face appears. And you know then that the game is over and that the beloved is won. And in winning, you've won. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. One of the things in terms of practices. You well, know, it is beautiful, but it is terrible also because you do have to suffer the incredible stupidity of your long searching for something in nothing, in the nothingness of your own fantasies and desires. You do suffer that. And you'll also have to suffer the agony of love. You'll have to suffer feeling, oh my God, this love loves me so much, but I love it so inadequately. I'm always trying to bargain with it. I'm always trying to make it do things for me, win me that book contract or get me onto Oprah. What the hell? My fantasy little ego is wanting, and it's all such rubbish. You will go through this massive, massive cleansing process. But all through that process, you will be given, as Kabir says again and again, signs and hints of just what wonders await you when you finally give everything that you've been doing up and enter into the silence in abandoned surrender and love. That's beautiful, Andrew. That was where I was going was to look at, you know, the practices, uh, meditation, contemplation, prayer, reading sacred scripts, these, these books that come alive with the, with the beloved. And one of the things, you know, I, I teach meditation, one of the things, moving meditation, both Gabrielle's work and also sitting meditation. And one of the things that often will happen, somebody will be doing, you know, well, they'll start out, they'll start out about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, something to start out. And they're seeing, you know, they're calm and they're seeing unicorns and rainbows and everything's nice. And then all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. You know, there's beetles wow. under my skin and and woodpeckers pecking in my head. And memories and, of horror, yeah. Right, and 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 uh, and that's that's the that's the good meditation. That's when something is actually coming up that's been suppressed and pushed down. But it 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 chases people off. And how to get, oh, you're doing good. That's good that you're noticing all those things. But well, you're dealing with a culture that is hopelessly narcissistic and seeking self-gratification by any means possible. So you have to start realizing that. You're also dealing with a culture that is polluted by fake mysticism and has been told that a weekend's um, mild retreat will get you anything you want, a house, houseboy in Malibu and flat and all of this absolute radioactive manure that's been sold in the disgusting bazaar of the new age. So you've got people who've been both traumatized and polluted and fed a completely ridiculous and obscene version of the mystical journey. 
what people need is the real map. And that's what's given by the great mystics, especially Rumi and Kabir, and they need to be told simply what the stages of evolution are and what at each stage you're going to have to deal with and how to keep practicing so that dealing with it can open you up to even deeper joy and even deeper realization, but you can't get out of the pain and you can't get out of the work and no one has ever achieved ultimate realization without a great deal of suffering and a huge amount of work that's how it is and, all, if somebody and, came to you and said look i want to learn french in a week you'd start falling about and screaming with laughter i've tried to speak flawless french for 40 years i speak good french but I make terrible mistakes in the future perfect subjunctive, which every French writer does because it's very hard. Nobody knows how to do that text. There's many, many mistakes I keep making because French is a very difficult and gorgeous language. And if you want to speak it well, you want to really, really dance with it. The same is true of mystical realization. You're going to fail a lot and you're going to suffer, but so much love is helping you discover that yourself otherwise die ignorant what are, what's the alternative <laughs> there are two ways of suffering on this planet one is that you suffer and learn nothing and the other is that you suffer and through grace learn everything right. choose the second yeah it's like suffering and pain are road signs this way go this way <laughs> not go that way go this way towards that move move into it but also suffering is not something to be terrified of suffering is what makes you human more compassionate more generous more wise instead of listening to the cultural voices that tell you that any kind of suffering needs to be fixed immediately become an adult and realize that suffering is partly, if you're a half decent human being, it's because you've suffered enough to stop being such a radioactive arsehole <laughs> in your life. How many poets have talked about the-, the, the I wisdom. could say arsehole because Kabir <laughs> says all sorts of ferocious things to people. It's true though, isn't it? Let's face it, let's stop playing games with this obscene culture that causes so much suffering because it cannot face the necessity of suffering in life or its beauty or its transformative power. And how many poets have said that the breaking of the heart is the opening to love? In how many language, in how many ways? But how many human beings have experienced that quite simply in the course of their lives? Yeah. Yeah. Who were we before our hearts were broken? We were selfish, narrow fantasists about power. That's who we were. You were talking a minute ago, and I was remembering one of our first meetings in New York years ago. I don't know if you remember, but it was just after The Secret came out. Oh, my God. <laughs> and you and oh. I were both <laughs> like, no, no. I knew The Dark Knight was coming when The Secret was hailed as a mystical revelation in the world. <laughs> crazily put it on and all sorts of famous teachers came out and parade it's a disgusting vision of god as a kind of endless atm to our petty desires it would be fatal if it was true because if we were able to manifest what our ego consciousness wants that would only entomb us greater and more deeply in illusion and you were the first person for me that that you know i i felt that in me i couldn't even watch it and I felt that. And when you went off on, uh, it's like cabaret singers in hot pants selling, you know, you, you, it was, and it was, it was. And that's that, that um, uh, false, um, uh, uh, well, it's a spiritual bypass, I guess it's. Uh, no, it's not. It's demonic. It's not. Your demonic, yes. Let's say it like it is. It's demonic. Yeah, let's take it's demonic. <laughs> you to imagine that the force that is creating all of the universes and that is transcendent of anything it creates is something that you can bargain with to get you a houseboy and a Malibu mansion is about as stupid as thinking you can sing grand opera because you can sing the note C. 
its complete obscenity and it polluted a whole generation because it reinforced instead of detonating the crippling narcissism that was already polluting everyone the narcissism that a soulless consumerist culture places at the core of its lack of belief yeah Andrew, we're getting close to the end of the time. I know you have a, a time constraint I do, here. But read another Kabir poem that speaks to you. That's what I was going to ask for, please. <laughs> no, look, you read, you read. Oh, me read. Yeah. Well, I've got so many marked here. It's hard to... Well, read uh, one, because I want people to realize that this isn't just my invention, this book, which okay. is available in Amazon, by the way. So. Okay, here's, here's yeah. what I opened to, February 4th. Eyes grow tired from seeing. Mm. Eyes grow tired from seeing, ears from hearing, even a beautiful body grows exhausted and worn. When old age comes calling, all senses grow torpid. Only craving for the world stands tireless and strong. Oh fool, you've done nothing to earn the wealth of knowledge and contemplation. Your whole human birth you've spent in vain. That's Kabir. Yeah. You're not going to get pretty sweet little messages about how fabulous you are, which is what the new age has thrived on, because it's realized that people just need endless flattery and being told that they're already amazing, which is incredibly stupid. Kabir is going to tell you if you you're going to get old, your senses are going to get torpid. And if you haven't done the deep sacred inner work you'll just be facing death with terror and bone ignorant. However famous you are, however many books, how, if you're president of the United States, none of that is going to matter. The only thing that matters in life is your realization. Hmm. Andrew Harvey, my dear friend, it is such a delight to be with you. I, we didn't get to talk about sacred activism, so we have to meet again soon. Oh, we will. But I, uh, I want to tell people your website, andrewharvey.net. Uh, so much wisdom there and uh, so much gratitude from for all of my listeners. I just want to thank you for your tireless passion around so many issues particularly climate change, which you and I have been a long stand for awakening to that area. So thank yeah. you. My pleasure. God bless you. And please, everybody, do give yourself the deep sacred present of engoldenment, because Kabir will help you in the deepest way if you let him. And it's my deepest, deepest prayer that you will let him, because amazing things happen when you do. Hmm. Much love to you, my friend. You. We'll talk Thank you so much, Michael. God bless you. God bless your life. Bye-bye.